There we are. Uh, gentlemen and uh, in the panel and ladies and gentlemen in the audience, uh, I'm very glad to uh, chair this session on ESG investing in Asia. Uh, the full title is Post-COVID. I'm not sure we're post-COVID yet, but uh, definitely ESG investing in Asia has never been as interesting as it is, precisely partly because of uh, questionings we have on COVID, but uh, on many other developments, uh, long-term trends that, that keep developing. Today uh, in this panel, we have four great, uh, I don't no, if I want to say specialists or practitioners, in fact, uh, they're both specialists and practitioners. And on those fields which are eminently practical, I think you, you, you ought to be a practitioner to, to, to deserve being called a specialist. Uh, we have four panelists, Ara Brutian, Kaidai, Rajiv Lal and E.J. Podar. Uh, from different parts of the world, different uh, time frames uh, as well. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, let's talk about the few aspects which uh, Frank Jürgen Richter had highlighted for us, uh, ranging from uh, uh, investor confidence, uh, stems of uh, ESG criteria on the environment, on social and governance aspects, and with a real issue in mind, which is how to stimulate those investments. What are the kind of actions that can be done by companies, by startups, by coalitions, by banks, and we have practitioners uh, and by, an, and, and by uh, the, the consultants as well uh, who in this uh, field, which is uh, so fast evolving, uh, the consultants and the influencers ha have a great role to play to keep framing uh, those norms. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce very quickly the four panelists. Uh, so Ara Brutian is Director of Sustainable Analytics based in Canada. Nice to see you, Ara. Kaidai uh, is the CEO of the Young and Sustainable Impact uh, Greater China, uh, which is a um, incubator. Uh, and Kaidai, you're based uh, out of Shanghai, if I'm correct. Yeah. Ranjiv Lal uh, needs no further introduction, but he's now the chairman of the IDFC Institute India, but he's based today in Singapore, where uh, our conference would have been supposed to take place. So we all remote, but uh, Rajiv, you are on the spot where it ought to happen. And AJ Podar is the man managing director of uh, Synergy Environix India. And AJ, where are you based today? Okay, so let me make a little bit of a correction, Joel, because I think you did not get Frank's last email. Uh, Frank, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. And Aaron Kumar Sharma. <laughs> so that's right. That's me. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm Arun, and uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C., uh, and I'm the president of Grove Pike Associates, uh, which is a global advisory firm. Uh, which advises a few large uh, clients around the world, including the IFC, MasterCard, uh, SMBC, Stanchard Ventures, and a few others. And uh, a long uh, history in ESG investing at the IFC. Uh, some of it a bit contentious with my friend Rajiv, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we will not discuss that today. Great, uh, right. We, we might discuss that still. Thank you. Sorry, and, and thank you, Arun Kumar, uh, Shama, Arun, for introducing yourself. As I said, it, it's always the best way to do. Uh, Ara, do you want to start uh, to start the conversation uh, in a few minutes to bring your points to the floor? Yeah, quite absolutely. Uh, thank you, Joe, very much um, for the opportunity to speak. So, uh, my name is Ara Bujan. I'm the uh, head of Smart Technology at Sustainalytics. Sustainalytics is an ESG research and ratings house uh, that has started its operations in 1992. And this uh, past July, we have become part of Morningstar. So now we're Morningstar CSG Center of Excellence. Mm -hmm. We're present in about 17 locations around the world and have been uh, one of the key players in the area for the past couple of decades. And uh, I'm uh, heading the uh, smart technology area, meaning application of machine learning, uh, information extraction and retrieval, and digital curation to sustainability processes. So that's the angle through which I'm looking into the uh, ESG world, ESG reality. 
And uh, as uh, it's already been mentioned, I think the key, uh, the interesting uh, aspect of today's conversation is that we're still not in the post-COVID world. We're more uh, trying to guess what the post-COVID world's reality would be. I think the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about the post-COVID reality, ESG post-COVID reality in APEC region is that one important uh, ESG aspect we've been seeing prior and during COVID, meaning the big difference between the G element of ESG compared to EMS, the focus on go corporate governance has traditionally had or had traditionally been the very strong in Asia for reasons that we'll touch upon. Uh, that gap, I think, is surely uh, going to be breached over time and COVID has been triggering the um, importance in the eyes of analysts, in the eyes of investors, in the eyes of the corporates. COVID has been triggering the import, has triggered the importance of E and especially S element of ESG. I think that uh, one, one of the key points I I'm trying to make, I'll be, I'll be trying to make today is the uh, bridging of this gap and that, you know, uh, in every bad news, there's probably an element of a good news. And that's what COVID has been bringing to us. The relative balance of e, uh, all three elements of E and SG sh uh, should be emerging in the region as a result of COVID. I think that's uh, one key, uh, key point that I, I'll be trying to make today. The other is going to be the point about the COVID has made it clear, uh, has made clear the need for uh, standardization in reporting. If prior to COVID, ESG has been in this stage of uh, being talked a lot about and its importance wasn't uh, uh, contested in any way anymore. I think that post, uh, during and post COVID, what's become, uh, what becomes important is investors and analysts are really pushing for meaningful disclosure, especially on climate risk and especially on water management. We're talking about a region where probably about 70% of people still live on subsistence level. And uh, corporate disclosure isn't meaningfully standardized yet. So I think in the post-COVID reality, under the pressure of investors and analysts and also uh, under the pressure of regulators, standardization in ESG reporting with regards to risks, both on exposure side and on management side, will become, uh, will become really a matter of today. Uh, and, uh, one reflection pro, it's not probably as much on, uh, with regards to post COVID reality, but it's about today. I think that the SG uh, integration still remains in, it remains in its relevant infancy as of today. And investors, analysts are very often asking, uh, about how they could do ESG integration, uh, and integrate ESG data, which is still not very much comprehensive. In the post-COVID world, I think that the how of ESG investment and ESG integration will become much better understood and COVID probably has accelerated this process compared to the uh, pre-COVID reality. So these would be the three main points I'd like to stop uh, talk about today. No, thank you so much, Ara. Your point on bridging the E, the S, and the G is very clear. Uh, your take on kind of standardization or convergence is, I think, uh, something that can inspire the panel. Maybe some of your fellow panelists will have some reactions uh, in this world of competition. That's interesting that this part of the uh, corporate, this part of the industry might be going to standardization. And as you said, you speak from many offices in the world, so you, 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 I'm sure you have some reason on that. But this point on standardization is all the more interesting that uh, you know there is this debate on whether the post-COVID world will be better, not so good, or different, and etc. And you have one, or not, not even 180 degrees, but 360 degrees uh, answers. You seem to be very clear that on, on this key focus point there is standardization. So I take this takeaway mm -hmm. to put that into you know, your, some reflections from your, your fellow, fellow panelists. Uh, Kaidai, you're observing and practicing 
this from China. China is said to have much less COVID cases, to be maybe one of the few country and the largest country, the the only large country, large uh, economy in the world, which is not so affected after all by COVID. Uh, how do you see those issues seen from the perspective of startups? Last but not least, it's always said that startups need to grow first and then to, you know, bother about all those issues later. I, of course, don't agree with that. What's your experience? What's your uh, feedback from Shanghai? Yes, thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm Kai. I'm from Young Sustainable Impact, and I'm also based in Shanghai. So in today, uh, there are so many sessions and uh, many sessions. Anytime when we talk about the pandemic, talk about the geopolitics, we cannot avoid talking about China. So I'm also very happy to tell some stories. And actually, China is also a big victim of climate change. Like flooding alone this year has caused about $27 billion of damage. But China is not the only victim of climate change. And we are very committed to, to do something for it. And in the September 2020, uh, I guess you may know Chinese President Xi, Xi Jinping announced that China will strengthen its uh, 2030 climate target of peak uh, carbon emission in 2030. And we want to achieve carbon neutrality in 2060. And according to the Carbon Action, uh, action Tracker, this commitment alone will lower global warming projects by 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees, which is the largest since the uh, which is the largest single change uh, it has recorded. And after this announcement, there's a there's a group group of researchers and who also set up set out some roadmap to the 2060 in the, uh, energy saving and emission reduction targets in the four, uh, 14th of five year plan. And for example, uh, increase increase the proportion of non fossil fuels in the primary uh, energy assumption uh, assumption from fifteen point three today to uh, twenty percent by twenty twenty five. And second, then we should have a, a, a annual a, annual carbon dioxide emission cap of ten point five billion tons, which is only to zero billion tons more than uh, this year. And Third, and we need a much tougher enhanced decarbonization measures after 2030 to bring China in line with 1.5 degree of par uh, Paris target. And uh, yeah, uh, as you have men has mentioned, uh, this pandemic is unprecedented, ten unprecedented. Even though China has a good job uh, in controlling the cases, but uh, there's still a lot of issues. For example, we have some privacy issues. And also at the early stage, we still have a lot of issues with governance and the society. And also it, it really instruct us how we should deal with, how we should live with our planet. There's an, all the Chinese saying say, says, people can do more than the nature. But actually, we should align with some natural principles. We are not human; are not in, capable of doing anything. So, uh, in this regards, we China have our uh, pandemic stimulus package, which is about uh, five uh, five hundred six sixty five billion dollars this year. A lot of this package on the ESG. For example, um, a lot of this uh, package are investing on the. Uh, clean energy, uh, 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 electronic vehicles, and also a lot of inf infrastructure, which aims to lower our uh, carbon emission and make our society better uh, with a better governance. And I guess another point I want to talk about is about business. Of course, we are incubators. Even though we believe sustainable, uh, a lot of nonprofit can do great in uh, business. We still believe the power of uh, uh, the power of business in sustainability. Uh, China has uh, achieved a lot of great things in easy of doing business. Like in 2015, China was ranked the number 90 in easy doing business. But last year, it was number 30, uh, 33. And uh, in in in, 20, in 2015, it takes it takes on average 31 days to start a business. But now it only takes nine days. And also uh, in 2015. Uh, China was ranked 122 in minority shareholder protection, but today it's only 
uh, China was ranked uh, number 28. So uh, there's a lot of pop opportunities in China in ESG investment, and there are a, a, lot, a lot of entrepreneurs. So if you have any chance, come to China to invest. You are more than welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kai, for this very clear picture. And uh, thank you for recalling. Usually people mention the 2060 uh, timeline of carbon neutrality, but I think the 2030 or before 2030 mm -hmm. reaching the peak <coughs> sorry, is actually where uh, China will mm -hmm. hit uh, something and can accelerate, uh, contribute to accelerate uh, some transitions around the world. Thank you, Kai. Uh, uh, Ara had a presentation where he was reminding us that the S of the ESG becomes very important. You focus not only on the E, you focused on the G, but you focused a lot on, on, on the opportunities and the business opportunities on the E, Kai. Uh, now I would want to, I, I don't know if uh, moving to, uh, to, to Rajiv and Arun as the two of you are linked to the finance sectors. I don't know if you guys will touch a lot on the G, uh, but, but maybe this will be so. Rajiv, I'm turning to you first and then Arun. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned in the conversations we had last week that uh, there are two issues, uh, at least uh, with the financial uh, uh, we, we, with the financial world. One is to see how the technological revolutions which happens everywhere else will affect the business models and will enter into finance. And of course, the key question in our panel is how this can contribute to developing and contributing ESG. And then we see, and I think it, the second question would be, as we are at the key moment with this post-COVID or COVID crisis crystallizing quite a few questions do we see do we see a momentum do we see a momentum in esg for i would say not uh, the proactive part of finance but for the bulk of finance for mainstream finance in the conversations we had last week you mentioned we are, we are at a momentum can you just detail a few of those aspects uh, yeah. And, yeah. and maybe last but not least uh, to re reassess the link uh, with uh, with the UN SDGs. Right. So thanks for that, Joel. So um, um, as you said in your introduction, I um, oversee uh, what we call a think do tank in India called IDFC Institute, which is focused primarily on um, solutions in the public policy arena, working mostly with state governments. But I'm also part of the global UN steering group on SDG financing. Um, and as part of that initiative, um, uh, which has actually been working through the pandemic, um, there's been some very interesting learnings for me. And one of the, the striking learnings has been the pace at which um, mainstream um, capital is pivoting towards accepting uh, in some way, shape, or form, adherence to ESG investing principles. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, um, professionally managed assets globally are over $200 trillion, right? And of that, in 2018, that's the latest available number, um, those that were uh, declared themselves as adhering to ESG principles amounted to 31 trillion. So that's about 15% of total uh, professionally managed assets around the world. And, and in 2012, this 31 trillion was less than 12 trillion. So it's more than doubled um, in the space of eight years. And I rather suspect that over the next four years, um, this number is going to grow exponentially. So, um, uh, and the pressure is coming, um, uh, not surprisingly, from there's a, another interesting tidbit that Accenture put out a few days ago or some time ago. Um, they estimate that by 2030, um, some $30 trillion equivalent will be transferred from baby boomers to the next generation um, of inheritors, and that number goes up to 75 trillion by uh, by uh, by 2060, uh, by 2060. And these younger uh, 
uh, wealthy are really in the vanguard in different ways, but all pulling in the same direction of wanting to make sure that professionally managed money becomes more accountable to wider obligations, um, specifically ESG. So that's the, that's the big trend. The second big learning to the point that was made by Arak earlier, and you know, given that his firm is now part of Morningstar is already an indication of the trend, is that uh, particularly over the last 12 months, the sense I get from the perch at the, at the UN um, is that initiatives for standardization of measurement, which is absolutely essential to really facilitate the large scale flow of money into ESG aligned investing is also reaching uh, a tipping point. And um, whether they are principles and frameworks for um, investing in, in unlisted equities, but much more importantly, I think will be initiatives for framing the principles uh, pertaining to investment in public equities. And there, a particular initiative that really caught my imagination is the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative. Because I feel that if the general community can, you know, like, like uh, the accounting principles, drive towards a consensus about how to restate climate adjusted, for example, accounts for various companies, that could have a revolutionary impact on the professional asset management industry and disclosures. So if these principles were made um, voluntary disclosures, but the uniform across the world, um, I can see a number of regulators actually making it uh, encouraging listed companies to adopt these disclosure norms. And then I think there'll be no stopping this. No, thank, thank you for sharing your views, not only on the metrics, but also on, uh, I would say, the initiatives, because <clears throat> once the macroeconomics are there, once we know that these assets will be transferred, we need projects and we need ways to measure those projects. So thank you for mentioning the, the, the those initiatives and uh, for underlining, in a sense, the fact that some initiatives might come from the governments, that's the UN. Uh, some might come from the business themselves. Some might come from like-minded organizations or, uh, or from the academic, uh, from the academic uh, as well. Um, Arun, you're a senior advisor to MasterCard. I don't know if this is from this cap you want to speak, uh, but you've known Rajiv for some time. Uh, you've, engage, you, you've engaged into a long conversation. Uh, so here I will not share uh, your 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 conversation, but uh, I will uh, be happy to 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 attend to your 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 usual conversation. What is it that you usually exchange, and what what are the the key points you can bring out of your uh, recurring conversation uh, to our panel? Yeah, so I would actually the you know uh, follow on Rajiv's uh, you know comments uh, in two aspects. One is from a macro perspective, uh, you know, I am, apart from everything else, also a senior fellow at the IIF, the Institute of International Finance, and uh, uh, involved with the Sustainable Finance Task Force there, one of the objectives of which is to help the financial industry around the world coordinate uh, all these efforts to create these common disclosure standards, including uh, also coordinate the financial institutions' reactions to the impact weighted accounting, the TFCD, which is the Task Force on Climate Disclosure, the work of the NBGS, which is the Central Bank Association for Greening of the Financial System. Now, there's a whole range of issues around that. So while the trend is extremely positive and encouraging and heartening, I mean, I think it is worth also pointing out that at the ground level, when it comes to harmonizing regulation across the world for a range of partners. And in the case of the IF, we're looking at insurance, asset management, as well as banking. And it's, 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 a, it's a big task. But the encouraging thing is that we have 128 members in that task force, and we get attendance of 128 literally every time. Uh, so that's, that's certainly encouraging. And I think 
is way. But I think the informal, the practical uh, movement, I think, is even more powerful. Uh, at Mastercard, I'm supporting uh, uh, a program to create products that will generate uh, sort of day-to-day -day loyalty on the part of millennials, which uh, are clearly the biggest vanguard of, of this change. Uh, so we have uh, potentially the concept of a green MasterCard program, where among the functionalities of that, the three or I'm, four. I'm not, a, I'm not a millennial. Can I benefit your green card? Yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it is. It's it's so there are three functionalities. So there is a functionality which is in collaboration with a Swedish company called Docomi, which actually can automate, which measures your the carbon footprint of your spend, and actually you can place a like a cutoff when your carbon footprint spend of your carbon footprint has increased in reached a certain level uh, there's another functionality which actually allows you to donate to the what we call the priceless planet program in mastercard where essentially we plant a tree for each card issued uh, at our cost so the financial issu institution issuing the card doesn't have to bear mastercard pays it out of the balance sheet and what we want to do is to use that for other things. And then uh, what we are also encouraging, and I think with other banks as well, is what we call a green deposit program, where the banks essentially take a sustainable deposit. And the idea is you commit to use that money for a SDG-aligned activity. Mm. And you have the technology now to inform the depositor, literally in real time, exactly where the money has gone. And essentially, the idea is not so much to gain a market share on deposits. The idea is to create this kind of emotional connect with this growing base, which actually feels that the relationship now is not so much as a customer and a bank, but more as partners in supporting the a more, more, more sort of a sustainable environment, more, more sustainable planet, I, would, I should say. So... So th that's one part of it. Now, just coming back to the COVID aspect of it, I think it's very important that there are, you know, as, as I think, uh, you know, as was said earlier, that every, you know, this cloud does have a silver lining that apart from bringing people kind of in a very forced way to think together and act together globally you know, in terms of organizing the production and now hopefully distribution of the vaccine, there is a, a, a also a great opportunity uh, to really invest in things that, that are heavily underinvested in the E space and the S space. When I'm talking about health, I'm talking about sanitation, I'm talking about clean water. All these things essentially are fundamentally, uh, you know, failings of, of our society globally, where, you know, we've made tremendous advances in technology and, and this and that and the other. But some of the basics that involve the sustainability of humans as a society, as a, as a race, for that matter, you know, have not be, have been thoroughly underinvested, and that's that's an area that I think that is going to get a lot of attention because we do now have the benefit of technology mm -hmm. to actually look at things that were not kind of pop, you know were seen as public goods, but these could be private opportunities or at least certainly opportunities for public private partnerships. So there is, I would say. Two, two ways to think about it. There's the whole macro trend of organizing ourselves in a way that standardizes things, universalizes things, and mainstreams things in terms of ESG. And then there is a whole a new opportunity set that can be systematically exposed, not only as a public good, but as private goods as or public-private yeah. partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you so much, Arun, for mentioning uh, the issues of the issue of new opportunities. Because, where, as as I said, when there is the macro trend, uh, then you need for projects to need for projects to create those projects. You need to earmark that those projects actually avail to ESG, and then you need actually opportunities, and right. you need to frame an opportunity is is a project which is framed into right. the into the right metrics. So I thank you. Really, Arun, for, for flagging those things. We are entering, gentlemen, into the last 15 minutes of our conversation. That leaves a kind of 
three minutes each. Uh, I, I'm moving uh, back to Ara. Ara, I, I saw you uh, took uh, many notes when uh, everyone spoke, but uh, in particular when uh, when uh, Rajiv mentioned uh, <clears throat> some of the opportunities uh, that we have to now and, and the tipping moment. Uh, I would want to, to get back to you on, on standardization. You mentioned standardization. That's on the process. Uh, the other panelists mentioned uh, new trends. Are those new trends uh, in silo or are there ways that the E, S and the G are connected not just at the level of standardization? It's already a great achievement to be able to speak about something as different as E, as S and G in the real world, they're completely different. You know, they, they were just a list at the end. No? Mm -hmm. the, the standardization happens on norms. It's wonderful. It's important. The normative dimension is important. But now that we see many developments in sectors, are those sectors operating in silo? Or do you see as an observer, as an analyst, more and more integration of E and S, S and G, E and G, or ESG in, in more and more projects, more and more sectors. Too big a question for three minutes, but uh, you're, a, you're, a, you're an analyst, so you will manage. Yeah, again, my answer will come more probably informed by the technological dimension. I'm a, much more a technologist than an analyst. Indeed, we see, uh, and you're right, Joel, ESG has uh, probably started that has been for some time a very siloed area, right? Some of my colleagues refer to, yeah, used to refer to ESG as, you know, the extra financial analysis. And that's almost a definition by, by exclusion, by negation. But uh, recently with COVID, with, uh, you know, other global macro, macro trends, non-COVID macro trends, we've been seeing this, if I may use the expression, the outside in type of an integration between E, S and G. By necessity, the industry has started to try to understand how the three areas on many levels, on the levels of their constituents, are uh, uh, are knit together, if you will, and it's not only it's not only trying to put an to put connections on the top of ESG on the meta level. It's also seeing how an element of G, let's say, could be directly affecting an element of S. For example, if I tell you go to sub-element level, we talk a lot about standardization, but standardization, as you mentioned, can take on the level of, can take place on the level of norms. It can take place on the level from where I'm coming to of uh, reporting and standard, uh, standard disclosure that makes it easier for people like I to take that information and to process. But I would say the most important element of standardization comes probably from uh, on the investment side to understand how E, S, and G are part of the whole and how if, uh, if, uh, if I'm interested, let's say, in corporate governance, I think the thing is that in the post-COVID world, every investor will need to look into the, let's say, the G element and see which E and S elements are affected. So by, by controlling for this G element, which E and S elements are affected by um, by uh, by his decision on on the G element, probably I know that we have only three minutes. The one thing I would like to leave the audience with is that there is no silver bullet way of doing ESG integration. Yeah. Integration is the key term here, and uh, the lack of understanding of ESG issues results in the lack of comparable ESG data. A single ESG reporting standard would be beneficial, but uh, it's, it's a consequence, it's not a cause. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of understanding. We need more understanding. Yeah, yeah. Uniformity, um, common knowledge in, the, in data. Thank Quite you, so. thank you, Rafa, for that. And thank you for reminding us that technology is at the core of that as well. Uh, Kai, uh, Ara mentioned that, you know, the ESG used to be called the extra financial. Now, what you've said with this uh, package programs from China, uh, of course, the ESG can no longer be and maybe never were ex exactly the extra financial, at least when the G never was uh, in China. But very quickly, in three minutes, uh, how central, how Intra-financial has ESG become in, in China, especially for startups and for the startups you incubate? Uh, How is yeah. the business model based on that? 
Yeah, actually, uh, due to time constraints, I really want to share uh, an example of how Chinese corporates involve in ESG. So uh, I guess you know Alibaba, right? They have a they have a corporate social responsibility program called Ant Ant Forest. Okay. So basically, you can get you can earn points from your commercial activities and low carbon activities. For example, I ride a shared bike. I I can earn some points in Ant Forest, and then when I collect collect enough Ant Forest、uh, points, I can try to、uh, plant. I I can try to plant a tree here and、uh, and and to find a, a a location to plant. My trees, and this is one of the biggest uh, uh, corporate uh, social responsibility program in China. And I just、uh, heard that NASA said uh, uh, since two thousand and twenty five percent of reforestation will、uh, will all come from China, and a lot of reforestation are come from the Chinese corporates through their social responsibility programs. And yeah, I just really want to share this this example. Thank you.、Uh, a good example is、uh, worth ten thousand explanations.、Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is also a Chinese proverb. Thank you,、uh, Kai, for for sharing that. Rajiv,、uh, if you allow me, I know your institute institute works on global large issues. But in an earlier life, I've been an Indian myself, so I want to ask you about India, as IDFC Institute works on India and with India, engages with India. Uh, someone said that on India everything and its reverse is always correct.、Uh, where do we stand in terms of ESG? What are the drivers in India?、Um, so there are,、um, uh, and I know that India in three minutes is unfair. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> very, very, very briefly.、Um, so there is,、uh, to your point about every point and its opposite is true in India simultaneously. Um, I think there is room to be simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic、um, in the case of India. Um, uh, but let me talk about the optimism, the basis for optimism first.、Um, on the uh, uh, positive side of the ledger,、uh, we have two important developments. I think the first is that the government、um, is actually very seized. Of its broader obligations, including global commitments、um, on on the climate front, and so the push towards renewable、um, is actually very tangible and very real. So the expansion of、uh, renewables-based generating capacity、um, has actually gained momentum.、Yep. Um, at times, I'm scared at the speed with which it's growing because we haven't solved other problems in the overall system, the energy management system in the country. So there could be an accident、um, in the process. But at least for now,、um, we have、uh, the support and backing of the government, and on the basis of that, there is a very significant amount of investment that is taking place. So, cut a long story short. On the 175 gigawatts going to 450 gigawatts, India is actually keeping pretty close to its、um, its、uh, pretty grand promises on the global stage on that front.、Uh, the other reason for optimism, I think, is that India, because of its scale、um, and the nature of、um, the entrepreneurial talent that is available in in the country. Provides actually a huge opportunity for、um, socially conscious impact investing that is also commercially remunerative, and the pandemic actually has accelerated、um, the search um, um, and the investment momentum behind these kinds of initiatives. So, technology-based distance learning, for example. As a way of solving last-mile education problems, that has grown very dramatically over the last、uh, couple of years. Likewise, um, um, health-related technology to deliver diagnostic assistance to the last mile,、um, to deliver、um, public health solutions,、um, collecting data from、uh, large pools of insured populations. 
um, to proactively manage health concerns. These are things, um, uh, business models that are prolifer- proliferating very rapidly behind some very talented young entrepreneurs and inspired capital. So that's all very positive. On the on the let, let uh, sorry if, as we are short of time. Let's, let's stop on the optimism. I will not go into let, pessimism. <laughs> we are optimists. Yes. We are especially fair in enough. India, you know. Okay. Th- thank you for sharing that. You've covered the E, then the G, then the S. I think the S is central, but it's another mm-hmm. debate. Arun, I'm told we have three minutes and forty five seconds. Suppose those forty five seconds are for me to close. You have three minutes. Full three minutes, uh, like everyone. Uh, would you mind talking about uh, ESG in the US as you're talking from DC today? Is that sure. an option? No, I think it's a it's it's a good opportunity to be optimistic, uh, like we are in Ind- for India. Uh, we do believe that the Biden administration uh, uh, will come in, and uh, and I think the change uh, is going to be significant. I have no doubt about that. You know, with uh, given the political choice of John Kerry as the ambassador. And the it'll be a lot of work. I mean, as late as October 2020, uh, you know, the Trump administration actually issued a labor policy uh, uh, guideline. Uh, it was asking, basically, privating pension plans from focusing on um, uh, investment mandates that supported certain ESG uh, type of uh, focuses. So they said, do not do ESG. Basically, that was the message of the administration. Uh, So that is going to take a lot of undoing. But I do believe that the groundswell of support for uh, moving towards ESG is is going to be very strong. The other point I want to make make very quickly that people don't, you know, understand is that despite the Trump administration, ESG did not die in the U.S. I think the fact that the U.S. corporations, the U.S. investors, the U.S. public did not really buy into the administration's uh, desire to move away from ESG, to move away from Paris Accord. And the fact is that the general corporate and I would say public sentiment towards ESG was still strong, fundamentally and philosophically. I do believe that it did not have the momentum and the policy backing that is needed to accelerate it to the way it, it could have been. So, yes, there was an opportunity cost, but we have a good chance of recovering that now. Thank you, Arun. That's very clear and very generous of you because now I have one minute and 30 seconds. It's more than I thought. So, gentlemen, let me thank you all. Let me thank the audience. I don't want to uh, summarize a rich discussion, uh, which has been, I think, not too frustrating, though it was... uh, uh, short, but I think it's more encouraging to 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 look at some other issues. One is, of course, uh, data structuring. One is norms, but bridging the pillars across ESG. As a, if I keep that as a takeaway, we are rather optimistic on the way to use the COVID nineteen crisis as an opportunity to bridge across these ESGs. And last but not least, as Horasis is also a business conference. We've been able to cover China Inc. We've been able to uh, cover the Indian entrepreneur and even Wall Street of late. Um, I don't know if there will be a Larry Flint uh, agenda uh, in the U.S., but it's also good as we're talking Asia to see that the U.S. are back in the region uh, as they are back in the world. Uh, and last but not least, I think the future will, will something that has emerged, the, the, the future will be around uh, voluntary disclosure, voluntary engagement, and the uh, generational issues will be important with the millennials and not just the millennials. And with this, we're getting over in two seconds, one second, and I thank you all uh, for your participation to a great, a great, great session. It's been enjoyable uh, to chair. Thank you. Arun, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. I think I'll do stop streaming now. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good. Okay. So, um,